Hi everyone, my name is Frank Alzheimer, and I'm the Science and Operations Officer, or Sioux, with the National Weather Service Office here in Charleston, South Carolina. Thanks for joining us for our inaugural episode of Ask the Sioux, where I do my best to answer the questions that you ask me through our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube accounts. We got a lot of great questions, and we're gonna concentrate on two questions for this episode. They work with varying parts of our atmosphere. The first question has to do with naming process for tropical cyclones. And the second question has to do with the dreaded polar vortex. But since we just suffered through an ice storm here in the Charleston area, I figured I'd start answering a question that's a little bit warmer and that is the naming of tropical cyclones. The first thing we need to do for a little background is explain how tropical cyclones get their names. Intense tropically based cyclonic storms are referred to by different nomenclature in different parts of the globe. In the Western Pacific, these types of storms are called typhoons. In the Indian Ocean, as well as the South Pacific, they're called cyclones, and closer to home in the Atlantic in the eastern and central Pacific Oceans, they're called hurricanes. The process of naming tropical cyclones began in order to make it easier to identify the origin of the storm, rather than trying to identify a storm strictly based on its latitude and its longitude. In the beginning, storms were named rather arbitrarily. Often they were named after the place where the most damage occurred, such as the Galveston Hurricane of 1900. Then in 1953, the National Hurricane Center began naming every tropical storm in the Atlantic Basin. Today, tropical cyclone names are maintained and updated by an international committee of the World Meteorological Organization, with input from major meteorological agencies such as the National Hurricane Center. Original lists featured only women's names, but in 1979, male names were introduced as well. There is a strict procedure to determine a list of tropical cyclone names in an ocean basin by the regional body responsible for that basin. There are five regional bodies across the tropical globe. The one closest to home is the RA4 Hurricane Committee of which the National Hurricane Center is a member. There are several others spread into the Pacific and Indian Oceans. For Atlantic hurricanes, there are six lists of names that are used. Each list is used one year, then recycled six years later. So the list of names that were used in 2013 will again be used in 2019. However, sometimes there's a storm that's so deadly or costly the name gets retired. Examples of this are Hurricane Hugo in 1989, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Now let's talk a little about Haiyan versus Yolanda. Haiyan was the name given by the Regional Center for the Western Pacific, the Japanese Meteorological Agency. The Japanese followed protocol and named it Haiyan as soon as it gained its tropical characteristics based on its five lists of rotating names. However, as the storm developed and moved closer to the Philippines, the Philippine Atmospheric, Geophysical, and Astronomical Service becomes responsible. And they decided to name the storm Yolanda, thinking that it would resonate more closely with the local natives. Individual countries can give these storms their own names. However you name it though, whether it was Haiyan or Yolanda, it was a super typhoon, the equivalent of a Category 5 in the U.S. and caused a devastating path of destruction through the Philippine nation. Now that we've warmed you up a little bit with talking about tropical cyclones, next thing we're going to tackle is a question that's been in the news quite a bit lately, and that's what does the polar vortex really mean? We're going to try to dispel some of those myths and also do a pretty good job at explaining what the polar vortex means to us here in southern South Carolina and southeast Georgia. 
First, we'll start with a definition of the polar vortex. According to the American Meteorological Society's Glossary of Meteorology, the polar vortex is a large-scale cyclonic circulation in the middle and upper troposphere, centered generally in the polar regions. This definition was put in print in 1959, so it is not a new phenomenon. Now let's take a look at the polar vortex in three dimensions. In this image provided by NASA, which is over the southern pole, you can see the cooler colors representing lower heights in the middle portion of the atmosphere. Those lower heights represent more dense air underneath and hence colder air when we look at the surface. If now we turn our attention to the North Pole, here's a map of the average 500 millibar heights during the month of January from the years 1970 to 2010. The polar vortex is represented by the darker blue colors. You can see on average that there is a center in far northern Canada on the north side of Hudson's Bay stretching across the North Pole and then another extended center down towards the Aleutian Islands and to the east headed towards Siberia. Now as we all know things change from year to year and winter to winter. So if we look at 1977 very different from that mean the polar vortex was extended farther to the south over eastern Canada and over the North Pacific, producing much below normal heights and colder temperatures over the eastern half of the U.S. Switching instead to 1989, we see the opposite, where the polar vortex is much stronger and closer to home, and the heights and temperatures were above normal in the eastern part of the United States. Of course, not only does it vary from year to year, but within the year, there's quite a variation from day to day. This particular animation shows a daily 500 millibar height field from January 1st to 31st, 1977. You can see all the different undulations and changes as we go from day to day with different blasts of cold air moving into the eastern United States. So now the question is, how does the polar vortex influence our temperatures along the southeastern United States seaboard? Well, during the month of January, it can have a really big influence. Let's say, for instance, that that polar vortex is farther south than usual and is located over eastern Canada instead of over the poles. Now, remember that the polar vortex is an area of low pressure in the middle and upper portions of our atmosphere, so we're talking about 15,000 feet or above. The flow around that is at jet stream level, and so the cyclonic flow will drive air from northern and central Canada down into the southeastern United States. In January, that air can be very cold because the source region of that air is western Canada. Western Canada is home for Arctic air masses in January, and that change in jet stream will drive those Arctic air masses all the way down into the Gulf and southeast and that means cold weather for us. Some examples of how this has happened is in 1977 and in this past January of 2014. Now if instead the polar vortex is in its normal position or maybe even stronger than normal up towards the poles, the jet stream is instead focused from west to east across the continent of North America. So those areas of Arctic high pressure in western Canada instead move more towards the east rather than to the south and therefore it's not nearly as cold in this part of the country. Now you can still get an occasional anomaly where you get a cold outbreak during these times but you don't get persistent cold as we've seen in January of 2014. Thank you for joining us for this inaugural episode of Ask the Sioux. We will be doing these every month for the foreseeable future. While we still have plenty of questions to answer, we always like to hear more. So please give us your questions through our Twitter, our Facebook, or our YouTube connections. Thanks very much, and we'll see you in a month.